Well, good morning. It's certainly good to see everyone on this first Sunday of the new year. And we're <clears throat> going to be talking this month about Genesis. Genesis being the beginning. Genesis answers a question for us in verse 1 that people through all generations have asked. Where did this all begin? Where did I begin? Where did we all begin? And, and Genesis gives us, as the believer, the answer. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And really all we need to know about that is, in the beginning, God. That's the answer for the questions that, that we have and that we wrestle with. Genesis goes on from the creation to talk about the beginning of our faith. That God is faithful unto His people because of the promises that He has made unto His people. That's Genesis chapter 12. And often, Paul would reference back to the relationship that Abraham and God had and the response that Abraham had to the promises of God. And he would encourage us to make that same faith our faith. The beginning is in Genesis. And knowing that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. Joseph's life showed us that. There was many opportunities for Joseph to doubt the direction and the way things would go and ask the question, who is in control? But all things work together for good. Maybe not for the good of Joseph, but for the good of God's people. This morning, specifically in Genesis, we want to look at creation. This evening, Brother Leon is going to walk us through the Genesis account of creation. But my argument where I want to stay at this morning is that the foundation of our faith is that God created the heavens and the earth. When, when Paul would walk into the synagogues to teach and have dialogue concerning this new Jerusalem and this new era, he would assume that they believed that God created the heavens and the earth. He would have, have assumed that the Jews that would have been gathered there in those synagogues would have believed that God created the heavens and the earth. That's just foundational. That's part one. And as you think about what that does for us in our lives, not only does it give us an anchor to answer one of the more difficult questions and the most common question that people ask, which is where did this all begin? We have an anchor for that, right? But also, it, it puts into place who we really are. And we could unpack that if we had more time, but I think it answers the question of who we are in two very specific ways. If God created the heavens and the earth, and then that same account tells us He created man, that means He is the Creator, and we are thus the mere created. It is an humbling concept to understand that God created the heavens and the earth. And therefore, if we look into society and this new age of thinking, why are we surprised that people want to reject that concept? In an age where self-exaltation is at the heart of everyone, and look at my resume and what I've done, why should we be surprised that people want to reject the Genesis account of creation? It's not the fact that they don't want to accept the Creator. It's the fact that they don't want to accept that they are created. And therefore, if they are created, they are limited and humbled. And therefore, the second thing that it tells us is because He is the Creator, we are accountable. We are accountable. Because therefore He rules all things. And He gets the authority to say, because I said so. This is His house, His world. He calls the shots. And therefore we become accountable unto Him. And you think about society 
We've thought about them in the way in which they do not want to accept this concept of being humble. But they certainly don't want to accept this concept of being accountable. And so I would argue this. That the Genesis account is not hard to wrestle with and believe because there's no proof. Actually, for millenniums, ages and ages and ages, society has attributed the beginning to intelligent design. That was almost inarguable. The Native Americans did not argue that it was intelligent design. Now, the same intelligent design? No. But the Native Americans would say, of course there was intelligent design. Look at how perfect it has come together. The older Asian cultures would attribute what we see to intelligent design. New Age wrestles with the concept of, of evolution and us having evolved and attributing it to chance. Why? Because they don't want to accept, accept being accountable to the Creator. And they're not humble enough to believe that they're mere created beings and they are nothing but dust. And from dust you are formed and to dust shall you return. And I would argue it is no intellectual problem to accept the Genesis account of creation. But it is a pride issue that is the heart of rejecting the Genesis account of creation. Turn to your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And I want to just, I know oftentimes when you speak to people and, and they talk to you about this concept, well, I believe in evolution. And that's true. You believe in it. I got this from the academic world. Science would be defined in this way. That it's present. Just meaning that it can be studied. You, you can have a microscope and take it out and study it. Or, or you can see it through pictures. Or you can visit a place. It is present and real. And it's repeatable. It's repeatable. Whether it be physics or anything else, it's, it's repeatable. It's observable. That's what science is. The, the science of old was dependable. The science of today changes to whatever narrative we want it to fit, right? Whether it be with COVID or anything else. If you want to change the science, you can change the science. That's not real science. Science is present, repeatable, and observable. Here's what history is. And we study science and history. It's in the past. It's non-repeatable. Certain aspects of history are non-repeatable. And there are eyewitnesses to that. Now, it may not be the eyewitnesses that have written down what happened, but they are speaking because of what they've heard from eyewitness accounts. In the, Gospels, that would, in the Gospel, that would be considered Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are historical books giving an account of what actually happened in history. And actually, to the evolutionists, those, those historical documents have been attempted to be nullified on every turn and say that Jesus never existed, but no one's ever been able to prove that. And so our history books write things that have been witnessed and seen. And then faith or belief is this. It's in the past. It's not repeatable and there was no eyewitness. I would argue that where it all began is belief. For me, it's belief. But for the evolutionist, was he there? No. What he says happened? Is it repeatable? Absolutely not. There's no piece of matter out there collecting more protons. And it's never happened again. It's not repeatable. And you know what that becomes? Your religion and your belief. So don't belittle what I hold to be truth because it's by faith because your answer to the beginning is also by faith. This is a leap of faith because none of us were there. But is what we believe 
repeatable. We'll talk about that after we read. Is what we believe repeatable? Because this Big Bang concept is not repeatable. Or at least it hasn't been repeated for 4.5 billion years. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. I would add, but by He who is invisible. The foundation of faith is the concept that you are created by a Creator unto whom you are accountable, be, accountable because you will find in verse 4 that by faith Abel offered, meaning by faith Abel understood he was accountable unto God. And the Hebrew writer would go on to say in verse 5 that without faith it is impossible to please God. And therefore, I would say that without faith in the creation of the world, without faith in Genesis chapter 1, you cannot also call yourself a Christian. They don't coexist. And we're going to close our thoughts this morning looking at what Jesus said concerning creation. And therefore, if you say you believe in Christ for who He is, you cannot also believe that we started from the Big Bang Theory. It won't work. The two don't mix because the Hebrew writer would tell us that faith and the foundation of that is that we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. This concept is the foundation of, of who we are. And I, and I ask the question, is it, is it repeatable? We believe that God created the heavens and the earth. And what we see in that is order. We see intelligent design creating order. Is that repeatable? Has intelligent design ever created order? Well, yes. Every house that we see as we pass by through the countryside, that was intelligent design creating order. I've spoken to my kids about this, but if I developed a YouTube page where I said that my wife and I drove up and down County Road 702 for months and months and months, and, and beginning there, it, it was just a piece of land. And it was beautiful, and, and we dreamed of there being a house there. And we drove by, and, we drove, and one day we drove by, and there was a, a lumber truck that drove by, and there was a wreck that occurred. And, and then a mason truck drove... And you see where I'm going with this, and we were to say... It just happened. And I said it was true every day on YouTube and I had my channel. What would they call me? Crazy. Insane. Chaos and chance does not create order. Generally speaking, chaos creates more chaos. Not order. What about the vehicles that we drive in the orderly fashion in which they are designed? Intelligent design creates order. So it's repeatable. And also, the seed process. If you plant an okra plant, what do you expect to sprout from there? Okra. How many times? Ten times out of ten. And that's just a repeatable process. And so what God put in place was orderly, and the universe has remained in an orderly fashion. And chaos continues to create more chaos. Cons Consider tornadic events, right? That's a chaotic event. Now, do they do some weird things and put bottles in different places and pieces of metal in strange places? Yes. But is there anything orderly left after that chaotic tornado comes through? Absolutely not. Chaos destroys. But the evolutionists would have to argue that chaos at one time in a perfect time did what? It created order. And it created an atmosphere. And it and made this happen. And now we have the gravitational force on earth just perfect enough. To me, that's a stretch. To believe that 
a divine being, created order, is repeatable. Let's continue in our thought, uh, thoughts and let's see that what's argued in Scripture is this concept that at the basis of knowing God is knowing that He's the Creator. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, we're going to have Paul speaking to two different types of people. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 and verse 16. Acts chapter 17 and verse 16. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day. Now let's first stop there and see who did he reason with first? As was his custom, he reasoned in the synagogues, right? He started there and he spoke to the Jew. And himself and the Jew would have been on the same page concerning creation, concerning Genesis 1 and verse 1. He would just move on. He would know that they believed in the creation account. But then he moves on to the streets and those who would have been worshiping those idols and in the marketplace every day would those happen to be there. Verse 18, some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. Now he's speaking to the Greeks. And he notices an immediate rub with the Greek. They're not on the same page concerning creation and where this all started. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others say, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what, are these, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their times in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So they were really just excited, not because of what he was saying, but because of the concept that it was a new idea. But we understand that they would have been idol worshipers. And they would have attributed what they see to different gods. Continuing in verse 22, So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. Brethren, I'm convinced you're going to worship something. You're going to believe something. It's one of the oldest civilizations known to man. Oh, and they were prideful. But even in their pride, they attributed where this all started to something. And so Paul said, not in the fact that you worship something is a problem. It's what you worship. You worship incorrectly. And I would say to the modern scientists and all that they believe, you're worshiping something that is incorrect. And I want to introduce to you a concept that is worthy of worship. And that's the argument that Paul makes here is he starts with what is worthy to be worshipped. Verse 24, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by hands, nor is He served by human hands as though He needed anything, since He Himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. There He is pointing out God as who we said He was at the beginning of this conversation over all things and in control. Oh, that would have scared the Athenian. Taking the control out of their hands and they can't make a new God for every little... No, it's one God. And not only is the world accountable to Him, and you see that, not only does the world follow after what He said, but now you also must be accountable to Him. And this would start to challenge them. Verse 26, And He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward Him and find Him. Yet He is actually not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your poets have said, for we are indeed His offspring. Knowing even you in your religion, in your false religion, realize we came from a greater being. We came from a higher power. And you've known that. But all I want to do is introduce to you where you 
came from. And he would go on to say that that God is not far from you, but He is very near. Verse 29, Being then God offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God's overlooked, but now He commands all people everywhere to repent. Bringing in, again, this concept of accountability that they have. And as Paul not only gave that address, but as he would write his letters to us in the faith, he would write this in Romans chapter 1. He would write this in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 19. Understanding there at Rome, it would have been a very diverse group of people. Jews who, again, would have traditionally accepted the Genesis account of creation. But also Greeks would have been converted there. Accepting a different form of creation. Still, this concept of evolution had not been introduced, but nonetheless, a false answer for where it all began. And in searching for the answer of where it all began, Paul says that's really where it all ended for those who did not accept the Genesis account. So see, this morning what I argue is the foundation of our faith is the Genesis account of creation. That is foundation to our faith. But here's the scary part. It is also the foundation and the beginning for all forms of immorality and sin and exploitation and everything that we see around us begins in the fact that they are unwilling to accept God the Father as their Creator. That's where it all goes wrong. And that is Paul's argument is if you don't accept this Genesis account of creation, you're going down a slippery slope. And one day you'll argue that man can sleep with man and be satisfied or woman with woman and be satisfied. And you'll make this argument that, hey, you know, gender is fluid. And Where do you get such ideas and such concepts? It's not from the Genesis account of creation for God created them both what? Male and female. It's not from there. But it's from your new religion that by chance we are here. Let's see what Paul has to say about that, starting in verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. And he's not arguing that God has shown it to them through the Scriptures here. He's arguing that God has shown it to them through His creation. Verse 20, for His individual attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. And the things that have been made So they are without excuse. You think that it's just chance that it's all perfect and there's enough oxygen in the atmosphere to breathe and that the rain comes and the seasons are here and you attribute that to chance? You're without excuse. God has made it clear that this is an orderly creation put into existence to serve His beloved created being. Continuing on here, verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God, or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking. Though they at one time thought they were wise, this form of thinking has led them to believe futile, be futile. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22, Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them up and the lust of their hearts to impurity, the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. And we read on there and we see all forms of immorality born out of this unwillingness to accept God the Father as their Creator. Turn your Bibles to to Matthew chapter 16. Many of us, what we're going to turn to in verse 13, you have memorized. This morning's sermon has not been some way to just prove to you. And you walk out of here and you say, Oh, Devin, I believe now. I I was once an evolutionist. Or if you're listening to this on YouTube and you think that, and you walk out here and say, You've given enough proof, Devin. I believe now. That's not what it's about. What I want to argue this morning is the foundation of the Christian's faith is the Genesis account of creation. And I think the Scriptures make it clear that once you accept another form, you're going down a slippery slope. 
But not only is it foundational to our faith, this is what Jesus was about. We're really going to open this portion of the lesson concerning Jesus in the same way we're going to close it. You reject the creation account recorded for us in Genesis. You know who you're really rejecting? Is Jesus. You're rejecting Jesus. And so now you, you're posed with the question, not where did this all begin, but what are you going to do with Jesus? You've got to do something with that historical figure. And He is a historical figure. For generations they've been trying to prove that He was wrong. That He never existed. Not only did He not exist, but He, never, he was never resurrected. They started that when he was in the tomb, right? They said, oh, if we let him, if we let him rise again, the next will be worse than the first. And they were right. Because he raised from the dead, the world's been changed forever. Not just this little group here at Hansville, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ changed the world forever. Amen. And it's an undeniable fact that it happened. Or else, these evolutionists and these idolaters would have proven it wrong. But time and time again, He's proven to be who He said He was. So the question this morning is, not what do you think about creation, but what will you do with Jesus? And that's the most important question that you'll ever ask yourself, is what will we do with Jesus? When Jesus was walking and talking on this earth, He would ask that very question in front of His disciples. Matthew chapter 16, and verse, starting in verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. See, they were already having to give an account for who He was. Now they got it wrong, but they had to give an answer for who Jesus is. We've got to figure out who this guy is. Verse 15, He said to them, I think now a more important question, but who do you? Who do you say that I am? And he's asking you that question this morning. Who do you say that he is? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood does not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus would say this about himself in Mark, turn your Bibles in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. The question is, of course, where did we all begin? And what are you going to believe? But I'm going to tell you, Jesus believed in the creation account. He should, He was there. But if you're struggling with that concept in your mind of who Jesus is, I would just simply say He believed in the creation account. Mark chapter 10 and verse 4. The people were speaking to him and they said, Moses allowed one man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Jesus, do you really believe in that Genesis account? <laughs> you think that's what it was? Jesus said... I believe in the Genesis account. I believe that it began the way that our Lord said it began. That in the beginning, God created them, male and female. And staying here in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 13, Jesus speaking of the one who would have authored that Genesis account in Matthew chapter 13, verse 19. My apologies. He's just speaking here of the abomination of desolation. He's giving them further prophecies. In verse 19, he says, for in, for in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. So who was He? Who was Jesus? Who was He? And if you believe He is who He said He was, you're forced to believe. The Genesis account of creation. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 5. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 5. In 
John chapter 5 and be here towards the end of the chapter. Verse 44. Now Jesus, speaking of Him who wrote Genesis, Genesis cha- uh, John chapter 5 and verse 44, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who is accuse- accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. If you believed Moses, you would have believed me. Moses spoke of me in that account in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. And then continuing there in chapter 1 and 2 where it talks about the creation of man, it says, let us make him in our own image. Moses was writing of the Christ. And John chapter 1 and verse 1 would verify that. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Moses was speaking of me. He did not in some way unvalidate the writings of Moses, but he upheld the writings of Moses. And he believed in the writings of Moses. And he says, verse 46 again, If you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Meaning they are inseparable because I am the Word. I am what He wrote. I am the words on those pages in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and throughout the entirety of Genesis, I am He. And if you can't believe in that account, you can't believe in me. So the question this morning is, what will you do with Jesus? And you may say, Devin, you're preaching to the choir, so to speak. I already believe in creation. I believed in it before I walked in the door, and that's fine. you still got to answer this question. What are you going to do with Jesus? Because Hebrews 11 and verse 3 where we started, right? You got that part down. You believe that by the Word of God the universe was created. But now you've got to do something about it. That's the rest of Hebrews 11. It's that people did something about the belief that they had in the Almighty. And my question this morning is, are you proving yourself through your actions to be accountable unto Him? Are you walking in a manner that says, I submit to Him? And I'm not the one who makes up this concept of you sin, you die. That's God Almighty speaking that. You sin, you die. And you're separated from God. Abandoned. But He doesn't want it to be that way. That's the whole reason verse 14 of John chapter 1 is there. The whole reason He became flesh is so that He could unite you unto Him. So if you're outside of Christ this morning, what are you going to do with Him? What are you going to do with the knowledge of the creation account that you have? Just keep on living your life any old way you want to live? Or are you going to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ and submit your life to Him? Whatever you need to do to be right with Jesus the Christ this morning, I pray that you'll do so as together we stand and as we sing.